happy sunday to all you all i welcome you to my channel this time today i want to use this opportunity to talk about uh, scholarship and admission uh, just a bit of background before we get started uh, you see this channel is motivated by the demand that I get from my social media. I got a lot of emails and uh, inquiries, both on private chat and in public posts, asking different questions. And it's over the time I've grown in, in terms of the number of followers and in as much as I would want to be able to attend to everyone, I couldn't do that because of uh, the, the volume of uh, messages that I receive. But actually helping out and sharing my knowledge is one of my passions so people suggested that this kind of uh, youtube might provide an opportunity to help me do that better and that is why i am here today to give you an opportunity to ask those questions that have been burning you've been wanting to talk to me about maybe i'll be able to attend to it here and other people would also share from the knowledge uh, uh but before i continue let me know that my voice is coming clear can i get to see uh you can feel free to type in that chat and tell me whether my voice is clear okay sorry also for the little hitches we had at the beginning of this uh, uh section uh, hopefully everything goes well from now so what i'm gonna do as opposed to trying to talk randomly uh so we can use our time effectively i'm gonna open up the floor right now for questions type your question in those chats i'll be looking at them and be responding but as i as i wait for the questions to come uh one thing i want to say is a brief of background about me if you don't know i am a professor of computer science at dalhousie university and uh, um, here in canada and uh, i'm also a canada researcher so what is uh, unique about me is that I'm not your, uh, the regular people that actually came up from a family where father and mother were educated and they uh, have the money to send their kids to school. So being here for me, it's a grace of God. And uh, I often look back and I, I, can, I, I get amazed at how I got here. But what is important or what, what concerns us here is that my journey moving from my little village in Enugu State, Nigeria, to where I am today is a miracle one. However, I did a lot of work. I won hundreds of admissions and many, many scholarships, I mean prestigious ones. And I was doing that right from home, most of them. So in the process, I made a lot of mistakes and learned a lot. In the process of moving from where i am to this place that presented me with a very unique opportunity that many people do not have because of the environment they grew up in so and i, I love the opportunity to be able to share that having that experience as a student and then transitioning to becoming a professor and then sitting where i can now know judging these applications and knowing what they look for and what they do not look for gives me a very unique perspective that what i'm talking to you today is from a very personal experience as opposed to what i read somewhere or what someone told me no i'm gonna share to you what i've done myself what i am judging people for and what my students are doing so hopefully it helps someone so let's get started so uh, someone, Emmanuel, asks, what are the chances of non-STEM students getting scholarship and graduate uh, assistantship? Okay, thank you, Emmanuel. Actually, uh, I am a STEM person, but I've seen thousands of non-STEM students, graduates, getting amazing opportunities, both scholarships and admissions. So it is as common to... I know that a lot of uh, uh, the promotion these days is towards STEM for uh, obvious reasons, but that does not mean that people do not appreciate the contribution of non-STEM people. There are a lot of scholarships for them. So most of the uh, uh, procedures that people in STEM would go through to get scholarship, people in non-STEM can also do that. There might not be as many, but there are also lots of scholarship and a lot of people have secured that scholarship and are already using it and graduating. I know someone that secured scholarship in history. I know someone from English. 
so i don't think that this is a typical stem related courses that i know people in sociology and even uh, art that have secured scholarship and gone ahead to do both masters and phd and they're now doing well for themselves so it's not like everything in the world is now become stem no it's not like that so the, the short answer is that the chances are high you can and the, what you need to do and how you need to put the application is almost going to be the same for people in STEM. Hope that answers your question. Okay, uh, Thompson said, I am a senior engineer with multinationals in Lagos. It's long. I wanted to, it is long. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to do my MSc, then PhD in electrical engineering backwards, especially energy and instrument, instrumentation along with robotics. So, uh, Thompson, what's the question here? It's, it's good if you want to do your master's and PhD. I mean, it's a good thing, especially you got in, if I would assume by now you have a lot of industrial experience as well. But, you know, the thing about uh, 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 coming back to school after you've been in industry for a while, there are advantages and disadvantages. Let me talk about the advantages first. The advantage is that if you finish in electrical and electronics engineering and have five years of experience, right, you've moved beyond what your grade, your graduation grade can offer to see application of what you have learned in in, the, in in real world so most times when we are recruiting we do not only look at the result the person is coming with right we look at relevant experience because what we're doing is solving important problems right so we appreciate people that have got industrial experience if you are applying and you are able to tell me how the experience you've gotten in the industry prepare you for graduate school or what you have gained in from working in industry that have propelled you to be in a better state compared to when you graduated that is very very much appreciated we look at that positively because most times like in my lab we work with a lot of industrial partners designing solutions for the industry so we look for people who actually have good grade but beyond that we look for people who have experience working in industry so it is a plus. On the other hand, if you've finished and you, you've been in the industry for a while and you're coming back to study, what I'm going to check is looking at your CV and what you want to, the, uh, the, the place you want to do your graduate school. Is there anything that closes that gap? Assuming you finish in electrical engineering and you, sorry, let me use that, this random example. I'm an African anyway. You finish in electrical engineering, but you found a position in the bank where you now eventually grow to become bank manager, starting from teller or whatever, marketing to bank manager and stuff like that. And you eventually want to come back to engineering. You've stayed 10 years working in the bank as a bank manager or whatever, marketer and stuff like that. You want to come back in engineering. I'll be hesitant to accepting you because that's the big gap. You have this 10 years gap from when you finish your study till now. And your experience you got in industry does not show that you you were still engaged with your your field within those 10 years so the assumption is that you have actually forgot you would have forgotten most of the things about electrical engineering that you read so i'll be very hesitant in admitting you because it would be a very big catch-up to do so those are the two it could be positive it could be negative depending on how what it is i hope that answers your question thompson How to secure additional scholarship for your years of experience. That's actually, uh, the, the way you secure scholarship is actually the way every other person secures scholarship terms. And what happens is that when you already get into the school, like uh, for me in my lab, I have a lot of multiple industrial projects going on. And most times when I get those projects, I look for students who have experience, especially those, those who have industrial experience are always an asset. So what we do is put them in those projects and 
with that industrial experience and you working with the industrial projects, you might be able to get additional funding, but it's not like we just jump and give you additional funding because you have industrial experience. That might qualify you to get scholarship, but uh, there are other factors apart from just your industrial experience. Factoring in what I have said before uh, would uh, help you get the clarity of on what you need. Interested in studying, uh, Ernest said, interested in studying data science and artificial intelligence. I got to two in chemical engineering. I have done boot camps. Are there scholarship chances for me? Mm, it's uh, it's uh, unfortunately, it's not a very good news, Ernest. Uh, the thing is, I'm going to be honest here because I, I have also been in admission committee and everything. The thing is, there are minimum GPA you need to meet before even we start looking at, at your application. They might differ from university to university and from uh, department to department, apparently. So if your 2-2 does not meet that minimum requirement, I mean, there's actually no ground on, on admitting you. However, there's a, there's a silver to that. If You've been in an uh, industry or whatever and got a lot of experience over time and did a lot of research related and projects related to what you want to work on. And you managed to have a, 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 a convince a professor that, okay, I have moved beyond this tutu. Like I finished five years ago and right now, within that five years, I have in invested myself in self-development, doing a lot of online courses and also projects that would enhance who I am beyond what my grade shows. So that is, that's going to be your point of argument. Sit down and tell yourself, what have you done from your graduation to now that, have, that could show that you are better than who you were when you graduated, that you have moved beyond the 2-2 grade and be able to kind of go for a further study right now. So if you're able to articulate that very well, and you're reaching out to pro because your application is not going to be automatically evaluated unfortunately because you do not meet that minimum requirement most times those applications are received and automatically rejected in some schools so but if you get to convince write that convincing uh, argument of in skill inventory and personal development and you manage to get a professor and convince the person that hey this is what happened due to certain conditions, but over time, I have moved beyond that. This is what I have done over time that shows that I have covered those laps, lapses in my result. And if the person buys in, the person might be able to stand to argue, to get you admitted. Apart from that, no, nobody jumps at two to or third class. Nobody does that because you have a lot of fourth class as well. Uh, looking for admission but i want to say that all news all, all hopes are not lost i've showed you i've shown you one way the second way you can go about it like in canada here we have what we call colleges colleges are equivalent of polytechnics in nigeria they give diplomas and stuff like that and guess what most of those people especially if you go to a, a course that is in high demand that you do it in college most of them will get employment before they even graduate so what does that mean what it means is that and the grade requirement might not be as high as that of university so you might also look at colleges college can also be like you do it and go to industry from there or it's become a bridging program for you i've seen some people who finished from bsc went to college did some diploma and eventually came back to university to do their graduate program so it can also be a bridging for you so also look at possibility of a college there are so many colleges here i hope that answers your question uh, uh, ernest valentine says i am on pursuing and advancing my architecture and card design skills abroad via scholarship please what connections help can you provide enable me achieve my purpose thing a uh, valentine what you actually asked for is not clear you are you're 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 keen at advancing your architecture and card design skills how how why must it be in abroad you haven't said you want to go for grad school 
do you want to go to technical do you want to learn a, a apprenticeship so your question is actually not clear i don't really know what what you mean by uh, by advancing it are you going to uh, 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 do you, are you looking for grad school are you looking for apprenticeship are you looking for a training program and uh, all those things so i'm gonna uh, just jump because the question is not clear to me Filane says, Prof, I have uh, an M -Eng in electrical engineering. How possible to secure PhD scholarship in Canada? I would like to relocate to that side. Uh, you have M -Eng in electrical. M -Eng. It's M -Eng, uh here. M -Eng is actually a master's without thesis. Is that what that means? If you did a master's without thesis, uh, the bad news is that you're probably not going to be considered for PhD because you didn't do research. PhD is a research intensive program. But if you did master's with thesis, then you have that possibility. So I, if your M inch is a thesis based program, then of course you can use the normal routes that I, I, I discussed in most of my blog to look for admissions for uh, PhD. But what I want to highlight here is that contrary to what many people might think, admission to PhD is not only looking at your results. We look at results in all cases. I can actually take someone who I have not, I cannot have done it. I, I can take someone who have two one, who have a good research skill in place of someone with first class. That's someone that, I mean, PhD, you don't do a lot of courses but you're going to spend four years trying to figure out things and do research. What enhances your chances if you're going for PhD is research potentials. And the easiest way to actually show that is via publications and getting involved in research. You know, what we don't know is that uh, uh, most people, especially uh, in Africa, would wait for a time they become gainfully employed and stuff like that to develop themselves. There's something called volunteerism. You can actually volunteer and get involved in research by a professor, both abroad and in Nigeria, and that gives you something to write in your CV. You can't just wait for two years and then there's nothing to show for it, and all of a sudden you just want to go for PhD or master's. It doesn't work like that. You plan it. So if you're thinking about PhD, please think research. Think about developing your research as much as you also need a good grade but think about your research it is very very important anthony says uh, uh, saskatchewan what is the life like down there just got work permit to canada oh saskatchewan was, that's where i did my phd actually I, I mean i still consider it home for me it's a very nice place uh, there's a lot of uh, immigrant community the uh, nigerian community they're well established i was there for four years and i liked it i still go back there it's good the only thing is that uh, canada is cold but saskatchewan is a bit colder so than uh, probably places like halifax and stuff like that but i will tell you that saskatchewan is is good it's not uh, one of the biggest cities in canada but i mean you don't need a big city to be successful and to integrate with the community i found it really a good place a good, a good place i wouldn't have any hesitation uh, going back there actually i still consider it home just like i said so anthony is a good place emmanuel now searching as an uh, as a matured student married with two kids Please, what's the advice? Well, no, I, I, sorry, let me still uh, uh, reiterate this and use it to talk to anyone. Nobody cares about your maturity and uh, uh, and uh, your your age and your marriage and stuff like that. Now that you've talked about it, Emmanuel, let me just say this: Hey, don't put your age, marital status on your CV. We don't need it. Nobody cares about that. We just care that you're a human being and you're able to do your job well. So that maturity doesn't even apply. What applies is that let me know that you can do your job. And if you have gap in your CV and stuff like that, tell us what has been happening, how your experience doing, doing what you've been doing since last you graduated applies and helps you to go further and pursue your, 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 your current, uh, 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 I mean, course of study that you're interested in going in. That is what is important. So it's not age by maturity. It is age by what you've been doing. 
the gap in your CV, that is actually what matters in most cases. Emmanuel, I hope that answers. Nobody knows you have two kids. Nobody even knows that you are married. You don't even need to say that. Chikuma, um, good evening, Prof. Evening. I'm currently doing my master's in public health in UK, but I would like to pursue a PhD in public health in Canada. Uh, so, Ima, what is the problem? Uh, yeah, I think it's uh, Chukuma. If you're doing your PhD uh, in a, in a, a MS in UK and want to pursue a PhD in Canada, it is possible. Uh, the, the advice I, I just provided helps. Make sure your eyes is on research. It is not like you can get 100 in your classes, it is good. But if you don't have a clue of what research is, you're not going to get it. So put your eye on the research as it is possible. Okay, uh, Emmanuel said I actually studied economics and uh, in search of uh, scholarship opportunities, postgraduate studies in the West, but thinking of uh, switching to environmental health economics. What do you, what is your advice? Environmental health economics is it not a branch of economics. What I what I want to say, a general advice is Emma, wherever you want to switch, to so make sure you can establish a connection between what you're going to do and what you have done before. A graduate school, especially in, in, in North America, it's not really usually easy. I have seen the people who didn't even study IT go to and do IT in masters in UK. Here, it is not possible. You need an undergrad. Like if you want to study computer science, even if you have worked in industry doing computing related work for 10 years, and you want to just come and do masters in computer science without a BSc in computer science, it's not always that easy because you don't have the foundation. If you're going to have a computer science uh, degree, you need to have the foundation. The foundation is not like you learned how to code. No, there's a theoretical aspect of things that we learn in class that you need to have to be able to get computer science. So you need to be able to make a connection between what you want to go and study and what you've studied before. And most times we've got exceptions where we get people who have who studied related courses. Like I have someone who studied electrical engineering who is joining my lab. In, in computer science the only thing is that we he's a very smart person and the result shows he has taken some computer courses during his undergrad so what we apparently do did is to give him a lot of undergraduate courses to uh, some undergraduate courses to take in computer science to take to build his background and after that he will not take the master's courses but he cannot just jump to master if he doesn't have that core Courses that so that applies to if you're moving from economics to environmental, you have to be able to do the core courses, establish that connection. It's not impossible, but it's not always like that all that easy and direct as you might think. Okay, uh, Filani, thank you, Prof. I have been involved in research. I published four papers with professional ID debased and I still involved in publishing papers thank you so much okay that's good congratulations thank you AJ there is a reason why the wind ghosts are called Saskatchewan <laughs> scream <laughs> that one you can actually get it on Google so I'm not gonna answer, answer that <laughs> that's so funny AJ Ekele how can we develop our research skills in preparation for PhD? When you're doing your MSc, I have I, I kind of uh, said a bit of that. When you're doing your MSc, is is the, is the first uh, starting step. Even your if you're still doing an undergrad, it is even good. I've seen a lot of undergrad come with publications. Choose a project that is probably have it in mind that your research you're doing is not just a research exercise. That is something you're going to publish, right? Think of solving a problem from the very beginning and ask your professors and others within your environment, how can I involve assisting research? That is the best way to get into it. You have to be conscious about it. You have to have that zeal that you want, I want to contribute, I want to solve a problem. I hope that helps, Akene. Okay, I'm going to... 
answer people that I haven't answered. Uh, James, uh, Chevalier scholarship must return back to their home country after their MSc program. As you mean, I secure a PhD scholarship in Canada after my MSc program. Will I be allowed to move to Canada? Uh, uh, um, James, this one is a bit uh, beyond my scope. I think you probably want to write the Chevening people about the uh, uh, possibility of doing that. I think what actually happens is that they buy your return ticket. And the moment you defend, they're going to give you that. You're going to, I think, so, uh, unless it's changed. From what I learned in the past, some of them, some of those uh, kind of scholarship would actually give you your certificate when you land in Nigeria. So some of them are really like strict, but I don't know how long do you, do they require you to stay in Nigeria before you are able to move? If you, assuming you get another scholarship, maybe you get an offer for a PhD. So these are the things you can actually ask them, ask the organization, like if you get a scholarship, uh, do you need to, when you go back to Nigeria, do you need to stay there for one year, two years, or is there a, a stipulated amount of time you need to stay? Those things would actually be online on, on Q&A. Or if you get another scholarship for PhD, can you move immediately? I don't think, I think that might be possible, but you might have to ask them to be sure. Oliver, would you advise someone with a BSc in math to go for MSc in data science or go for something Else but to run a data science online it depends on the drive <laughs> I mean I don't I wouldn't I don't advise people to to jump because data science is invoked to jump into data science uh, are you good in it that you had a mathematics degree does not actually make you a good uh, I guarantee that you're gonna be good in data science so the first question is are you good in it right if you are are you passionate about it if all these things are yes, then you should, con you should consider it. You should consider it. Uh, I, I, just, I just don't like people getting into things because others are doing it or because they think it's involved because a lot of people end up messing up because of that. They don't actually have a reason why they want to do something. They are just moving with the crowd. I don't like such a, it's not an intentional kind of living. Go back and ask yourself, why? What am I good at? Right? If you're good in it and you're passionate about it, then focusing on it squarely, 100% is, is the best way to su succeed. That would be my advice uh, concerning that. Uh, Oliver, yeah. Okay, can someone get admission straight into PhD from the universities? Uh, that's a manual. Yes, the answer is yes. Yes, but you, you, you also want to ask why do you want to do that? Yes, that if there are a lot of scholarship for PhD and your your professors feels like you can get you into PhD directly, yes. The, there's also another possibility which is available in most Canadian universities that if you get into masters and you're doing really very well, maybe after your first year and your supervisor see that you are good research wise, because that's often the, the thing, they might actually uh, advise or be able to help you transfer to PhD. In that way, you didn't finish the masters and then even the years you've spent before transferring will be counted towards your PhD. But I honestly, oftentimes I advise people to be very, very careful when doing this. You know, uh, I using myself as an example, when I finished my undergrad, I trusted myself so much because I, I am good academically. I'm, I'm very good. I'm not just good. So I knew I can do anything, right? But PhD is not, it's not that kind of good. It's not good academically that you're testing. It tests your maturity. It tests your ability to be independent, to think, to, 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 to face challenges, you're going to be broken down a couple of a number of times and you should have that maturity to pick up yourself again. It's not like your supervisor is going to add A, add A to B and add B to No, you're almost going to be autonomous. Do things on your own and report to your supervisor, consult with him when, time is, when it is necessary. So you want to ask yourself those critical questions before making that decision. If you need some bit of growth to get before you get to that step, I advise you take masters because in that way you can still get more time the expectation is still manageable you can still learn 
why doing that and then eventually decide grow into PhD or transfer into PhD I I I don't know it's it's an individual decision right but it's it, it all usually sound like I should rush into it but I wanted to consider it that PhD is not it's not like where what you did in your under, undergrad some of my PhDs are mentoring undergrad and master student are you of that I mean you need to you need that maturity gauge yourself some people might be able to do it but you don't it's not something that you should just jump into because you think you have first class in your first degree no PhD is beyond passing exam what you did in your first degree is probably just pass exam it is not it you're just probably gonna do a few courses the other time the rest of the four years you're on your own doing research figuring out things publishing papers. so think about it carefully it is a good opportunity but it takes some maturity to be able to handle it and then uh, the other thing too is that i mean some some schools if you have problem along the way they might back roll you and give you a master's uh, degree some others might not it might be that if you have a problem along the way you might not be able to you might just have to go go without any certificate again you back roll to your first degree so you want to think about it and see the chances that there some exit points in case anything happens because something might happen phd is a very long journey it is something else it is not close to what you saw in undergrad okay uh Okay, um, Chidima say I'm trying to get admission and scholarship to uh, study linguistic, masters in linguistic. One of the admission requirements is an academic writing sample. Yes, I request that too when people contact me. Yes, you need an academic writing sample. Uh, depending on your school, uh, your, everybody have done BSc projects, right, or thesis. That is possibly an academic writing sample you can send. So that's why I said most times we are not intentional when we're doing those things because those are the times you, you if you actually publish it, that's also another writing sample. But if you don't have publications after outside your, your project, please send in your projects. That is a writing sample they can use for you. Moses, good applause. Please, is someone already bagged a PhD here in Nigeria and still willing to apply for another PhD in Canada or US? Is it advisable to reveal that? Yes, it is advisable that you reveal it. It's, it's actually called, uh, this, I will call it academic honesty. And then beyond that, it can also be a good thing. I have people who are doing their second PhD, who are doing their second, I have one doing their second PhD with us. So it is not out of place, but you will just want to say, what is the reason of going for a second PhD, right? How is the skill from the first one going to help you? Is it just for migration purposes or do you have another reason? So these are the things you probably want to justify, but uh, yes, I would say it is, it is good to say it. It, it will be good. Uh, the bio. I have a PhD in computer science. I always had strong passion for healthcare discipline. I am planning to take online degrees in public health. What's your take on that? <sighs> yes, if you have a if you have a passion for health uh, industry, I mean taking a taking a, a degree in public a degree. Are you talking about a graduate program or just a first degree? It's, it's okay if you take a first degree, but what I'm, I'm probably going to say is that uh, you, did, you probably don't need a degree in, a, 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 in public health to, to do uh, IT for health. That is actually, I work in IT, designing technical solutions for health and wellness. That's what I, most of what I do. I don't have a degree in, in public health, right? So, yeah, it's, 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 it's good, but it's not required. It is not necessary. If you have get a certification, maybe, but first degree, I don't really know. I don't really know whether you really need to go that far. Ernest. Uh, 
uh, uh, I don't recommend professors and Nestor College. Uh, if you go to a uh, Google, you just type colleges in a, in a, in Canada. They will list a lot of colleges. Check them and check check the courses that each college offer. Right. Check whether there is a course that would interest you. Look at the labor market as well. And more importantly, if money is a concern for you, check their tuition fee. That is the best way to select the right college to apply to. You can also apply to more than one. The same thing if you're looking for a professor, it's not what I can recommend. You have to go to professor. It's, it's, it's a work. You've got to be able to do the work. I'm, let me tell you, when I was in my first degree, I didn't even have a phone. I didn't have internet. Right? So how did I, how did I do it? When I get any spare 100 uh, or 100 naira or 500 naira, I go for online, what is it called, online uh, browsing. And then in that online browsing, I'll just be checking out the schools and the professors and be writing. But right now you have phones at your hands. You have to just check the professors, read their work, read the one that is related to what you want to do and what you have done before and begin to contact them, write emails. And uh, I want to say this, don't expect that professors are just going to jump and reply you uh, when you write them. Maybe next time I might talk about how to write professors. It is in my blog. You can also check the blog. Uh, on average, I get an average of between uh, hundreds uh, mails weekly from people who want to work with who work with me, want to work with me. This is beyond other other emails, right? So most times we don't catch up with responding to those emails. So, but there are tricks on how you can write, and somebody might take a second to look at your email and see whether it's of anything of interest. We might talk about that uh, and the, the next time I'm going to appear. But the most important thing is that don't, please don't, don't ever mass email professors. Don't, don't ever mass email professors. It is an insult. It is a, a recipe for failure. If you cannot spend 10 to 20 minutes crafting a personalized email that shows me you have checked me in my work, publications and ongoing work, why do you think I can spend one second to read your email? Don't mass email professors. Take your time and do it. You might email 100 before you get one response. That is okay. That's how many people go, went through it. You have to give it time. It's not something you just hit and run. Mm -mm. A lot of people from the whole world are doing the same thing. So you're going to give it time. You're going to dedicate your time to searching it. As opposed to doing other things that are not adding to your personal development. Why don't you spend your data and uh, um, free time to doing this it will work it will work it eventually but you need to spend time it's not something i can stay here and recommend for you. it requires a lot of work i don't even know your area so you got to there's a lot of things involved but i think that you have the capability to do it but you need to give it time so i was going to address uh, the question from kyle Mika, so uh, talking about English proficiency exam, usually uh, for most Canadian universities, people from certain countries that are known as having English as their main language, such as Nigeria and Ghana, are, non, uh, are waived. They are waived from the English language requirement. So most times you do not have to, if you provide that you did your studies in uh, English and uh, both bsc and uh, msc in english most times you do not have to nigerians and probably Ghanaians. i have also Ghanaians i've admitted in my group is do not have to provide english proficiency exam we know that these people study in english so but if you actually want to maybe some schools in us requires it if you want to make sure you get a good grade if you don't provide, don't provide, but if you provide, make sure it's a good grade. I have seen people that would have otherwise be waived, their English language would be waived, but they ended up providing English language test or even GRE and the result sucks. The results are not good. So we'll judge you with what you provide. So it becomes a problem. So if you're going to provide, make sure you provide a good grade. Check the minimum grades. But most times in most schools, you, they, it's actually going to see it in their website. They do, like most schools in Canada, do not require that from uh, uh, Nigeria and Ghanaian and some other people. But it's often listed in their website. Please check it out. At least I know of the housing. Uh, computer science do not uh, require that. Okay, uh, 
Okay, James said, uh, what schools in Canada would I advise someone seeking for a funded PhD program? Okay, check for Canada. We have top 15 Canadian research intensive university. Even the non-research intensive universities, most of them offer funded PhD. In fact, in, my, in computer science, we're actually not going to admit you if there's no funding. It's either you have an external funding or we're able to provide you funding, especially for PhD. So most schools would right especially remember we can't actually admit you to PhD even if you you have one million publications i have excellent record if no professor have committed to saying they are going to work with you or supervise you we're not going to admit you so the first thing is always to go and look for a professor because if you apply nobody your application is almost gonna just sit there it's almost gonna be the in limbo until someone commit to say i'm gonna work with them or her i'm going to supervise them so looking for a professor, most professors would have uh, some projects, maybe funded, they are looking for people to work on it and that provide a, a source of funding. So looking for a professor is always advised. Finding a professor who is interested in you, I always advise people to start from there. Get to know research of the person and what they're interested in. AJ, hello, Prof. Are you aware of any viable remote PhD program for a reputable university with scholarship for us who move around? Uh, no, I really don't know about the about this. I think a lot of uh, the online PhDs and uh, the likes are in the United States. You can check them out. I don't know how reputable they are, to be honest with you. Okay, I think we should be winding down right now for today. Uh, Jonathan says, thank you, Professor. How much difficult, how, how difficult or easy to transfer to Canadian University from Europe? Why someone is in PhD? Really, 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 I'm not going to speak to this. I don't think I'm going to accept anybody transferring because it's a lot. A Canadian PhD and European PhD are different. I would say from my experience, European PhDs are more straightforward than Canadian PhDs. We have stages of exams here. We have to pass. You have to pass comprehensive, first do coursework, pass it, pass comprehensive, then go out to pass your proposal before you, you do PhD in proper and come and do it. These structures are different in Europe, so I wouldn't know how to match you to the Canadian system. So for that, I wouldn't, if I, if I'm, me as a professor, I might not accept you. To transfer from my, because I don't know how to place you. Would I place you you've done comprehensive? Would I say you've done a, a proposal? Of which stage would I say you? What about the coursework and everything? So it's difficult. But other professors might. But it's not straightforward. I haven't seen anybody do that. I have. I, however, I have had someone. Uh, I had people in my lab who came on visiting. They came maybe spend one year or two years with me in my lab. They are from another country doing PhD now doing part of their research in my lab after which we collaborated in their research publishing papers and stuff like that after which they, they still go and they write up their program write up their phd uh, thesis and defend right it's not like they're getting the thesis as in they are getting it from my university they're still getting it from their uh, from the university they came from and it's probably like the professor their supervisor there is aware of it so that's the that's the that's the thing but as per transferring entirely, it's, a, it's not a, that easy. It's not that easy. Some people might be able to do, but I'll tell you, it involves some, a lot of uh, calculations and stuff like that. Uh, Benjamin, Prof, do you accept someone with a biology background, BSc and MSc to a PhD study on, on that you know? No, Benjamin. No, no, no. It's a, it's a bit, uh, it's, it's a, a bit tough. For as much as I would want to, like I said at the very beginning, admission will require you that you have a foundation in computer science. Foundation in computer science means that you have bio, you have a BSc in computer science, right? I have accepted engineers into my department, into my lab. But the thing is that they have that, uh, they have some bit of computing background, and we give them some computing courses to actually take before they do their master to build their core 
so i wouldn't accept uh someone who is not uh with that kind of background into my into my uh, life because the person will struggle you will not be able to fit in however we have some programs in the housing that i really advise people to look at the housing have one of the rich richest computer science uh, 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 faculty in terms of the diversity of programs they are offer for example we have a program we call digital innovation program anybody interested can check that within that digital innovation i know that i have some of my students who is taking that we have what we call health informatics some people who specialize in health informatics and other people who specialize in it i i I don't is it digital media or something i'm not uh, don't quit me i'm not sure of the name but you can always check it out so what is important about this program is that they accept people from diverse backgrounds because you can specialize in management aspect or health aspect of, so they accept people from diverse backgrounds i've seen people from medical depa medical departments people that graduated from medicine and the like public health come into that program so it is more flexible that coming into other core computer science so if you're interested in such things check the housing university faculty of computer science check out digital innovation it's called digital innovation program they accept people from background outside computer science because it is meant to bridge the gap between computer science and other other departments so check out that program and again digital innovation digital is like d i g-i-t-a-l innovation i-n-n-o-v-a-t-i-o-n digital innovation uh, uh let me type it up it is masters in digital innovation so they have a lot of uh, other things you can actually uh, uh within that you can check different program under it you can uh, you can you might be able to fit in and uh, the housing actually tend to have a scholarship that is up at this moment maybe in my next appearance i will talk about the housing scholarship that the uh, deadline is coming up soon so look out for that i am we're almost an hour plus here so i'm going to be finishing right now any question i haven't asked like I currently got admission for masters at in on safety engineering in Texas AIM University Spring 2022. It is not sponsored. I will need your advice. Okay, I like I said, miracle. I, I like I'm a real, very realistic human being, and uh, I I'll tell you my opinion here. You know, I got a lot of admissions when I finished. A lot, actually, a lot. I was looking for fully funded, fully. I got a lot of partial scholarship as well, but I declined all of them until I got a fully funded one or some fully funded one and chose one. This is because I know I don't want to take risk. I don't want to just go there and be stranded. A lot of, I have seen a lot of people who don't have money come and uh, uh, sponsor them with their way through, but they, maybe they have other supports that support them to actually get started and hustle their way through. People will tell you you can work, but I don't think you, you have a limited number of hours you can work as a student. You can work for 20 hours uh, per week as a student. 20 hours per week is not able to raise enough money to pay your school fees and maintain your living expenses. So I don't know what to advise you here. You need to calculate your risk and opportunities and be able to decide how much do you have do you have someone that could support you and maybe when you're done or you can get a help in the person you can also you may also want to check for opportunities for funding within the university by contacting professors and asking if anyone need research assistant you can also get teaching assistant positions and stuff like that i wouldn't advise you to just jump into it and expect that miracle financial miracle is going to happen I actually want, I always want to see, calculate my risk before getting involved. And because I, I tend to uh, kind of tell people, if you're going to do something, try and do it well. Even if you don't think you're going to go to PhD next, at least do the master's very well. Most times when you're not settled about this financial thing, you end up either not finishing or not finishing as you would like, This, which might eventually affect some other plans you have in your future. So. Uh, do some realistic estimate and the analysis of your situation and that of your possible support 
and uh, see whether it is worth taking it or not and from also i would advise you contact the university look at the universities look at professors are there people looking for research assistant teaching assistant that you can apply for and be able to get some funding that will be my advice for you i hope this helps miracle No, the Halsey a Digital Innovation Program is not remote. It's not a remote program unless it just happened recently. Check, but I, the, the last I know, it's not a remote program, but you can still check. Okay, I think uh, we'll, I'll be ending it here. I was saying thank you all for coming. We will come on again. The next time I'll come, probably talk about scholarship. Um, that are available that you might uh, in, in the house and other place you can take advantage of yes um hello chiku can my lab assess student in digital innovation program yes i have some students that I'm, I'm supervising that are in digital innovation program i will not go straight forward that and accept but yeah i have people that are working in digital innovation program that are in my lab that would be the short answer so thank you everybody and enjoy the remainder of the week. I'm going to see you again and uh, uh, where we keep talking about more tips and how to move from where you are to the next level. But remember, it's all on you. You have what it takes to win. It doesn't matter how long you try. What is important is that you're going to win at the end of the day. So take that challenge, use the tips and uh, I will see you on top. Thank you everyone and enjoy the rest of the Sunday.